I'm Richard Taylor from the Philosophy Department at Marquette University. This is a lecture on Books 2 to 3, Chapter 5 of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And this is for Philosophy 2310, Theory of Ethics at Marquette University. So let's begin. So, Book 2 is about virtues of character in general. You'll recall that he made a distinction between virtues of intellect, or virtues of thought, and virtues of character at the end of book, book one. So virtues of thought concern more the natural dispositions that we have for intellectual understanding, whereas virtues of character are, are concerned with moral virtues that have to do with the, the consistency of character and are formed by habituation. And of course, that's the first thing he talks about, is that virtue comes about by habituation, not by a process of nature. You'll recall then again from Plato's Mino, which I discussed in class, you recall that Plato talks about virtue as involving something by nature, you need a teacher, and then you need to practice it, and the result is something truly divine. Aristotle learned from that dialogue, and from the discussions in his culture at the time, that it's necessary for virtues of character, not all excellence, virtues of thought, have much to do with the natural abilities of people that they're born with, of course. But virtues of character require that a person have the basic ability to learn as a normal human being, and then secondly, a good teacher to guide in the learning, and then thirdly, to practice those. And that, and that those notions taken directly from Plato's Mino are foundational to Aristotle's ethics of character. Uh, his notion of virtue, excellence or virtue of character in his Nicomachean Ethics. And we start out with that with book two. Now here briefly he reviews, in the beginning of this, he briefly reviews reasons to think about the importance of, of habituation and that ethics does not come, out, come, about, come about by a process of nature because all of us then would naturally be virtuous. So habituation is key for Aristotle. In Plato's Mino that was called practice uh, but it was not discussed. And of course that was the way Plato writes. He leaves some of the most important things out for you to think about. And so he did not discuss practice at any length. And that was the key to the notion uh, of virtue. So vir how is virtue of character acquired? And Aristotle says then it comes by habit, not by a process of nature. Of course, we have to presuppose natural abilities, but they don't come. the notion of virtue or excellence of character doesn't come immediately from that. So Aristotle says first, what is natural cannot be changed by habituation. We can't change our nature as if something truly is natural by habit. And natural capacities are not acquired by habituation. They're already there. So something is already there. And virtue is not like that. We're not naturally virtuous, according to Aristotle. Another sign of the importance of habituation is that legislators concentrate on habituation. We see that in our own society. We are habituated to drive on the right-hand side of the road. And if you do not drive on the right-hand side of the road, when the street is not a one-way street, but a two-way street, then in fact the legislators have provided that there will be tickets and policing will be involved. And you'll learn the habit to drive on the right-hand side of the road or learn the habit not to drive too fast, uh, etc. Fourth point here, so legislators concentrate on habituation. Fourth, virtue and vice are formed by good or bad actions. So they require action. And that action is uh, done again and again and again will leave us with a character habituated to be virtuous or perhaps unfortunately to be vicious. So these are just indications of the importance of habituation. So Aristotle's conclusion is that habituation is very important. He writes, a state of character arises from the repetition of similar activities Hence, we must display the right activities, since differences in these imply corresponding differences in the states, in the states of character. It is not unimportant, then, to acquire one sort of habit or another right from our youth. Rather, it is very important, indeed all important. That's what Aristotle writes. So if you are raised to have the right kinds of habits, they will form the right kind of character in you, and then it will be difficult for you to vary from that character. If you have the habit of telling the truth, it becomes part of your character and it makes it very difficult for you to lie. Or it makes it easy for you to be a person of good character who tells the truth. 
So what is the right kind of habituation? Well, for Aristotle, that's a good, that's a good question because the aim here is practical. That is the aim of ethics in ethical theory is action. So we don't want just the theory. Oh, our course is theory of ethics, but Aristotle is after ethics as bringing about the good, bringing about happiness and fulfillment for human beings. So for Aristotle, we don't just want to know, we want to become good people. We then, says Aristotle, we then have to consider the right way to act. And the right way to act in any, in any situation is action should express right reason. So our actions should express the results of our thinking things through in the right way, in the way things ought to be thought through. And second, in this case, the, the account has to be very flexible and inexact. One of the main reasons for that is human situations. Human situations vary and we need to take into account the real situation. Later on, Aristotle will talk about this as taking into account uh, all of the, the basic understanding and all the particulars of a situation. But also the account has to be flexible and inexact because we don't know what's exactly going on in people's heads. We have to infer that. And ethics will concern intention, having the intention to do what is right, that a person is trying to do what is right. But we'll do the best we can in this imperfect science of ethics. So for Aristotle, the right kind of habituation has to avoid excess and deficiency since these work to undermine the establishment of proper habituation. Just as I said in class, then, that an athlete does not train by going to excess, running 25 miles one day and then waiting two weeks and running 25 miles, but rather the, the athlete, instead of going to excess, builds up to it. So instead of mixing excess and deficiency there, you want to run every day or every other day in that in some way to establish the habit of it. And the habit will, just, will, will make it easier for you to do. Now, Aristotle remarks further that in, in inculcating habit in pe into people, pleasure and pain are very important. And he says virtue is also a concern with pleasure and pain. This is because pleasure can encourage us to do things that are bad or beneath us, and pain can and discourage us from doing good things, which are hard and difficult. So we have to find out from an early age just how to manage pleasure and pain. Because sometimes the right thing is not pleasurable. And sometimes uh, the, the, the wrong thing entices us by offering us pleasure. So those have to be controlled. But they do play an important role in habituation. Virtue involves pleasure, involves actions and feelings, and these involve pleasure and pain. All right, and we also use correction of inappropriate behavior in in use of pleasure and pain. So pleasure has a role to play here. He goes on with a few more instances. Then the soul is concerned with makes it what makes it better or worse. So it's concerned with pleasure and pain since they function that way. They're involved. Pleasure and pain are involved in the selection of what we do and what we want. Uh, as opposed to, uh, <clears throat> I mean, with regard to what's fine, expedient, or pleasant, as I have here on the slide. Pleasure and pain, we grow up with these, and they become foundational for the choices we make. And pleasure is hard to fight, says Aristotle. And what is harder is oftentimes better, so we have to be very careful about the enticements of pleasure, because they'll pull us in the wrong direction. So happiness, for, as we'll see later on, happiness for Aristotle is definitely not pleasure. But rather, pleasure and pain are two extremes, two, or two considerations with regard to the soul that can be used in guidance toward the formation of the soul in a proper way, that is, with excellence or virtue. Now, these sorts of claims about habituation present us with a puzzle for Aristotle. How can we become good without already being good? That is, good people do good actions. And as they do good actions, they become people, habitually, they become people of good action, and they become people of good moral virtue. But how do we get on track with that? How do we jump into it? Well, one answer is that, in fact, we do it because we're told to do it. And we're guided by our parents in that regard. So the idea that, that we, do we already have to be just? No. 
but ex people, people outside of us, good teachers, can put justice in us in the sense of having us practice it again and again in the formation of our character. Just as your parents expect that you're going to be a just person and a fair person at Marquette and not cheat on all your exams and that, uh, that sort of thing, so too, then, that is inculcated into you by habit again and again and again. Now, in Plato's Mino, Plato, it's a very rich dialogue. In Plato's Mino, he raises the question of what we call the lazy man's paradox in the same vein. That is, if I, if I don't know what virtue is, then why should I bother to look for it? And because if I, if I even were to find it, I wouldn't know it if I don't already know what it is. Now, I did the same sort of thing when I was a child, my father, with regard to spelling. That is, I said to my father at one point, after I did poorly on a spelling exam, I said, but Dad, how can I look up the word in the dictionary if I don't know how it's spelled? Because either, uh, either I won't find it, or if I do find it, I won't know when I found it, because I don't know how it's spelled. I actually did make that argument to my father, and he said the appropriate thing. Look it up. And that is, you have to try. So it's only so many times that you will look for the word pharmacy under F until you finally remember that in English, a PH is also pronounced the same way as an F. And so, eventually, we learn these things. The ability to learn is in us, but we have to search it out and to, to have right practice and to have guidance. In this case, my father was telling me, go back and think about it more and use the dictionary, and you'll find the right spelling. I'll tell more, more to you in class about that, that issue uh, with my father. So the first reply is conformity versus understanding, or conformity without understanding. And that's what we get from our parents. We are made to conform without understanding why these are the right things to do. And when we're children, we are not in a position to be able to reason these out for ourselves. So our parents and our culture tells us what is right or wrong, and that's what we grow up in. Perhaps later on we can reject it and choose something else. But we grow up in this initially. So in forming our, forming our character, others are involved, and they provide us with what is right or wrong in our culture uh, and in our families and in our human interactions, uh, at a, even though we're not able to understand it. So that's one way of, of getting it. The second way is, uh, as I put it here, craft versus virtues. So in the, case of vir uh, <clears throat> in the case of virtues, it's not the same as that of crafts, since good work in the crafts is determined by the evaluation of a distinct product. So we're not after that here. In the case of virtues, it's not a product that's being considered uh, in the evaluation. So what do we have to have to, in this case? The agent has to be in the right state. That is, the agent has to know what he or she is doing, and that is doing a virtuous action. So you have to know the action is there, and this is, we're talking about how we develop virtue in a person. So the person has to know and be doing the action because the person knows that this is the right thing to do. Second, the person has to choose or decide on it for himself, for herself. And, and third, it has to be done from a firm and unchanging state of character. Now Aristotle says these need to be more investigated in more detail, but you see right here the foundations for Aristotle. So, so one possibility is that when we have knowledge, and we're not children, we can figure out what the right action is, and then we choose and decide on it for ourselves, and we do it because we're a person, uh, we are persons of an unchanging and firm state of character. So you figure out what the right thing to do is, when you find the money, uh, you, find, you find the money hidden away somewhere, or you find it on the floor at a store, you think about it, and, and you figure out what the virtuous action is. It's not your money. It's someone else's money. So then you choose or decide on the action, namely the action to, re to return the money to the person if possible. You do that by going to the store manager and, and explain the money has been found. Maybe it's a very large amount of money, and, uh, and uh, someone will miss it very much. And so it isn't just 10 cents. It's a substantial amount of money. And you do this from a firm character. That is, you would not steal it. If it's not yours, taking it would be stealing it. So a friend recently, a friend this past weekend, told me that he found he was in, in Portugal, 
and he found a wallet on the street. And it had 1,900 euros and also some uh, U.S. dollars cash. Uh, and he thought it probably, f since it matched the purse of the woman who was walking down the street, it was probably hers. She turned out to be an Eastern European woman, and this was her vacation money for her trip to Europe, through the rest of Europe. And, uh, and it was hers. Uh, and so he returned it to her. Now, he didn't need it. The question would be, in this case, what is your character worth? Well, his character was worth an awful lot more than 1,900 euros and some American dollars. And at any rate, he doesn't steal. And when you take something that does not belong to you and you keep it for yourself, that's theft. And so even if you find it on the street, it doesn't mean suddenly it belongs to anyone who finds it. So my friend did this from a firm and unchanging state of character. And he didn't need a reward for it, but he did it because it was the right thing to do. These are going to be these are going to be uh, examined in greater detail. Some of these considerations for greater detail later in the Nicomachean Ethics, but let's proceed. So, as we see, then virtue requires habituation and therefore requires practice, not theory. So, the, so virtue requires for Aristotle then the three things as we saw from Plato: a natural capacity, learning, and the teaching that brings it about. You need a teacher, and habituation or practice. And this is exactly what we find in Plato's dialogue, the Mino. So Aristotle learned from his team. This now puts us in a position to have a formal definition of virtue, and then we'll really understand much more fully what we mean by moral virtue. So in putting together the definition, we want the genus, the difference, and the species. The genus will be the general area uh, of concerns, and then difference will be the distinguishing characteristic which narrows it down so all we often say with regard to human beings, human beings are animals, that's the genus, and the difference is rationality, and so human beings are in a species that is rational animal. So let's proceed with this then with regard to the def formal definition of virtue. So the general scope of, of uh, what this is about, with the genus, the area in which it would be found, is constituted by three possible things, feelings, capacities, or states. And for Aristotle, then virtue is not just a feeling or a passion of some kind that we undergo because we don't base excellence or of character on, uh, on the feelings that someone has. We don't praise or blame people because of their feelings. And anger and fear don't involve decision, but virtue seems to require it. And anger and fear are two major feelings. Further feelings may move us, but virtue and vice put us in a certain state or condition. So he rejects the idea that it's a that it's a feeling. And it's not a capacity either because we don't call people good or bad, virtuous or, or excellent, because of the capacities. So Aristotle concludes that it's consequently a state, or not a feeling or a capacity. Given that it is a state, then the question is what kind of state is it? The differenti what is the differentia or distinguishing mark of virtue? So it's a state. Now, we want to consider the human function. Remember, for Aristotle, everything has a function, and its excellence consists in the excellence of its function. So the excellent function of a hammer, which is a natural item, a claw hammer, is to both pound in nails and to pull out nails. And if it doesn't function well that way, we do not say it is a good or excellent hammer. And so, too, with regard to a tree. A tree is an excellent tree if it grows properly in accordance with its nature and fulfills its nature and gives rise to seeds, which then continue to populate that, that kind of tree in the area. So, for Aristotle, the, the human function, whatever it is, for Aristotle, it causes what has it to function well. And so the virtue or excellence of a human being will be what makes that human good and makes that human perform the human function well. So, uh, the, with regard to the mean here, uh, that we're talking about the, what's relative to us, then rel this will have to be something relative to our own nature and position. And this will involve a mean or an intermediate point between the contraries of excess and deficiency that's relative to us. So virtue, mean, the mean is part of what virtue is for Aristotle, and virtue seeks a mean relative to us. So in, uh, in this case, we might say that in the case of 
virtue and craft, you might say that, like the good craftsman who regularly makes good products by avoiding this extremes of excess and deficiency, so too virtue will also aim at what is intermediate between the extremes. Uh, there are arguments Aristotle gives from the nature of the virtue of character. In the case of character formation, it also seems to be the case that virtue aims at what is intermediate and avoids the extremes. This seems to be what excellence of character is about. <clears throat> so now we have a definition of virtue. So let's get it very clear. And we'll do this over again as well. But we'll do it this way then. Virtue is a, a, state, of, a state, which is deep-seated within us, that is responsible for decision sides. It consists in a mean between extremes, and the mean is relative to us as human beings. And how do we define that? That is defined by reference to right reason, that is, the kind of reasoning by reference to which the intelligent person would define it. So that's what we use. We use our, our rational abilities to define what the mean is and what the mean is relative to us. And I think as I mentioned in class, then the definition can't be misapplied because there are some things which do not have a mean. There is no middle point or mi middle amount, not too much, not too little, of such things as adultery, which is raised by one of Aristotle's students in class and reflected in the materials that have come down to us over the past 2,500 years into the text of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So the definition of virtue as a mean applies to individual virtues, and so, as we've already seen, virtue, or the Greek arete, or excellence, is nothing more than that excellence. We should be clear that there are two types of virtue with which we will be concerned. And of course, and those we've already seen, there are virtues of character, which we've focused on mostly already. But there's also virtues or excellences of thought, like wisdom, comprehension, and intelligence. And you discussed some of those in class essays, I believe. Uh, let's consider, then, the virtues of character here. The virtues of thought will be taken up later on, and they're discussed, uh, I think, as you know, in Book 6 of the Nicomachean Ethics. So, virtues concerned with feelings. Bravery concerns feelings and the middle point in feelings with regard to fear and confidence. Pleasure also concerns feelings, and this is at, uh, and about pleasure and pain, and the middle point in this is temperance or moderation. Aristotle also talks about generosity. You don't want to go too far or too be too little, give too little in generosity, magnificence, magnanimity, and, and other virtues. He lists them. And then with regard to anger, someone can be completely without anger in any way whatsoever. And someone can, can be someone who, who immediately jumps in and is easily angered. The middle point is to realize that there are times when it's appropriate to be angry, and there are times when it's not appropriate to be angry. And so we need to make this kind of judgment. And the middle point is the person who has proper indignation when it is appropriate. So it's all right to be, to be angry. With regard to truth-telling, then there are extremes of boastfulness and self-deprecation. Those are extremes. The middle point is to tell the way things the way they are without overemphasizing oneself, namely boastfulness, and without leaving oneself aside, self-deprecation. Wit uh, is, has to do with the a uh, sense of humor a human being has, and this is a virtue, according to Aristotle. The extremes are buffoonery, so everything's funny, and boorishness, nothing's funny. And I spoke uh, to, to the class about Dr. Reen in the philosophy department here at Marquette. Friendliness, there are also the person who is an ingratiating flatterer, that's one extreme, and another person is very quarrelsome. In the middle lies friendliness. And there are other states uh, that are not virtues, someone prone to shame, proper, proper indignation, just as we'll talk about in Book 5. So I'll get to that uh, in the next video. So then there's uh, Aristotle provides a bit more about the nature of these means and the extremes. The mean seems opposed to each extreme. The extremes are more opposed to one another. Sometimes one extreme is more opposed to, to the other than the mean. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, sometimes one extreme is more opposed than the other to the mean. This is the case with regard to cowardice. The deficiency here is more opposed to the mean, bravery, than the other extreme, namely rashness, the excess. 
There are two reasons for this. One has to do with the nature of the object itself, and the other has to do with us and our natural tendencies in reference to one extreme. So in the case of anger, we tend to, to have the virtuous uh, notion of, of bravery uh, is, seems closer to rashness in some respects, not identical with it, but closer than something that is completely different from both of them, and that is cowardice when someone completely flees the situation. So that's what Aristotle has in mind. Aristotle does also give us some practical advice. This is practical philosophy. He says, avoid the more opposed extreme, avoid the easier extreme, and be extremely careful with regard to pleasures because they can deceive us. They can lead us into making wrong decisions. These are not exact and precise guidance, but they give us some guidance, and they're practical. So, back to our definition. Virtue is a state that decides consisting in a mean, the mean relative to us, which is defined by reference to reason, that is, to the reference to the reason by reference to which the intelligent person would define it. All right. What are the preconditions of virtue? That is, what has to be there already for there to be truly virtuous action? We've already described what we've given a definition of virtue, but we haven't looked at the preconditions. And the preconditions involve this. First of all, the action has to be voluntary. What indicates this? Well, praise or blame seem to require voluntary action, and praise or blame are given with regard to virtues and human action. So because these are not given for involuntary actions, uh, because these are not given for involuntary actions, they uh, human beings receive pardon or pity, not praise or blame for some actions that are involuntary. Further then, force makes an action involuntary. And in this case, we're talking about the origin being outside the agent or victim. Uh, and so the agent or victim contributes nothing. And Aristotle's strong about this. Involuntary has to be very strongly so. Otherwise, we're responsible. What about duress? He's very clear. Duress does not make an action involuntary. So consider the, consider the example of someone, uh, of a killer threatening to kill your mother if you do not kill another innocent party, a child. Must you do it? Are you really forced to become a killer of a child in this case? Are you and further, are you responsible if the killer does kill your mother because you did not, did not kill someone else, or some two else, or some 50 other people? This is worthy of thinking about. While there's loyalty to family, there's also loyalty to, to doing what is right. And what's right is not killing other innocent parties just to save one's own, one's own family member. It's worthy of thinking about and reflecting on how we feel about this and how we think about it. So actions under duress sometimes seem forced and sometimes not. And Aristotle raises the question, that's very similar to what I just raised, about a, a tyrant threatening a person's family. But for Aristotle, this is more like the case of people choosing to throw a ship's cargo overboard rather than allow that ship to sink and all to die in sinking. That is, it's voluntary, but it's done under severe duress, duress which nearly makes it involuntary. We would say in modern day times then, even if someone were in a, in a terrible situation, a terrible home situation, and, and uh, was abused as a child, etc., this doesn't mean that the person is completely free to act as he or she would uh, in harming another child, but it could be something that makes the penalties less because of the great duress. We see that judges make decisions with regard to this at times. So this action then would be a kind of a mixture of the voluntary and the involuntary, but Aristotle says, on the whole, it's voluntary. And the reason for this is how it's done and where the movement started. So it's more like the voluntary, since it is done willingly, and it has its origin in the agent. That is, it's up to the agent, the doer of the action, whether the action will be done or not. So these are key principles in determining what's voluntary and involuntary. He adds further that praise or blame for mixed actions assumes that they are voluntary. Hence, actions under duress are not forced, and our definition of force is not undermined. So duress has to, it has to be very, very, very great in order for us to, to, uh, to have it turn into an involuntary action. Aristotle's close to the point of thinking that's 
it's not possible for that to be so great. We might want to think about that further because we know much more about human psychology. Now, what about what is pleasant or fine? Can that make an action involuntary? That is, does the excellence of what is to be gained by an action make something so attractive that to do the action becomes involuntary? That is, if there's a, for example, if there's a lottery ticket that you purchase one for your, yourself and one for your, your roommate, and your roommate's away for the weekend, but you see the results. And do you switch the, lo switch the lottery tickets because there's $200 million at stake? And further, is it the case then, given that we talk, at least in our, in our uh, American language and English culture, we talk about attractiveness, and we talk about, uh, particularly with regard to women's makeup and that sort of thing, we talk about having a look that is, that is uh, irresistible. But of course, irresistible, if we take it literally, would mean the person is not able to make a human choice in the matter. So irresistible is used in the, in the, in the extended sense. In the extended sense here, not in the full literal sense of it. Because a human being, uh, a human being is able to make choices with regard to matters, and are not we are not we are not necessarily controlled by our passions. We often allow ourselves to be, but we are not necessarily controlled by what is attractive to us. We need not, we, we cannot say that we were so attracted to such and such that our action was involuntary. Rather, our reason comes in at every moment, and that's Aristotle's emphasis. Now, ignorance without regret does not make an action involuntary. So everything caused by ignorance is non-voluntary for Aristotle. What is involuntary also causes pain and regret. And those are two emotions that are very important for Aristotle. He wants to keep that in mind. That is important in, in, our, in our, uh, our human context. We need to care about other people. And that's the kind of thing Aristotle has in mind here. So an action done in ignorance but not caused by ignorance is not necessarily involuntary. All right, but not caused done in ignorance but not caused by ignorance is not necessarily involuntary. Action caused by ignorance are different from those which are done in ignorance. The drunk or the person in a fury of anger acts in ignorance, not by knowledge, but his action is not by ignorance. His action is not involuntary. The drunk voluntarily puts him, him or herself in that situation. Of course, it's different if someone were drugged, but in this case, we were talking about someone who voluntarily put himself in a situation where he's not able to see perhaps a child along the side of the road and has an accident and strikes the child on the bike or something of that sort put himself in that own situation, and his action is not involuntary in that case. For Aristotle, a person who is vicious is one who is ignorant of the actions he or she must do or avoid, and uh, he or she is unjust or bad or wicked. But this needs some explanation, so let's consider ignorance a little further. Ignorance of particulars makes an action involuntary for Aristotle. He says at 111, I'm sorry, at 1111A1 to 2, quote, the cause of involuntary action is ignorance of particulars which, is, which the action consists in or is concerned with. For these allow both pity and pardon, since an agent acts involuntarily if he is ignorant of one of these particulars. So if you really don't know the complete situation, then you, your action will be involuntary. So I might slam the door closed with regard to our, our classroom, slam the door closed just at the time when a student is coming around the corner and into the class. I did not see the, I, I did not see the student there. I had no reason to anticipate there was a student there. And I seek pardon in that case. I say, pardon me. Uh, I apologize for this. Uh, and I'm very sorry this happened. Uh, but I closed the door in the student's face and it broke the student's nose or bumped the student or something of that sort. And I didn't know the student was there. There's no reason to expect the student to be there, but it still happened. So I voluntarily closed the door, but my, my striking the student's nose with the door was involuntary. 
was never intended, never foreseen, and so it was, it was uh, involuntary. In this case, then, ignorance of particulars makes the action involuntary. I was not negligent in this, in this example. We'll go on. So the definition of voluntary action, then, for Aristotle is that voluntary action seems to be what has its origin in the agent himself when he knows the particulars that the action consists in. So the voluntary action means you have to know the particulars. Now, are we controlled by emotion, desire, appetite so much that we, can, that we cannot act voluntarily? For Aristotle, emotions and appetites can't be regarded as involuntary causes of action. If so, if it were so, children and animals would never act voluntarily. But they do act voluntarily. But wait, keep in mind, and I think I've mentioned this in class as well, but keep in mind that with regard to children and animals, they can act voluntarily, but also not be responsible for those actions. And we'll have to explore this a little bit more. So what's required, though, it, in, in this case, is choice or decision. I, I prefer decision in this. That's the translation in our, in our book. And so let's stick with that. So decision or proiresis. And what it's not. It's not appetite because non-rational animals have appetite but they don't have decision. Incontinent people have appetite but not decision as the basis of their actions. And decision is not emotion because emotional actions seem to express very little decision. And decision presupposes deliberation. That's what it's after here. So it's not wish, because we can wish for the impossible, but we do not exercise decision regarding it. It's not belief. We can have belief about eternal things and impossible things, but we don't exercise decision regarding them. So what does decision require? It requires deliberation. So what we've done so far is, under, is, is delve underneath the notion of decision to see what decision requires. And decision requires deliberation. So deliberation is one of the things that's required before we can make a decision. And this decision involves both reason and thought. Now, of course, for Aristotle, not everything's up to deliber uh, open to deliberation uh, because we don't deliberate about how far it is from here to the moon or the nature of God or whether 2 plus 2 equals 4. These are matters that are not up to us. What is up to us are the sorts of things we can deliberate about. What actions we will take uh, in response to, uh, to our environment and different ways. But that's up to us. We are the ones who determine it. But things that are already determinable without, without us, uh, how far it is from Milwaukee to Chicago, precisely from this point in the City Hall of Milwaukee to the City Hall in Chicago, this is some matters of fact that can be scientifically determined. They're not matters of decision. So we deliberate about the actions we can do, and Aristotle writes the following then. Deliberation concerns what is usually one way rather than another, where the outcome is unclear, and the right way to act is undefined. Notice this part now. He says, we enlist partners in deliberation on large issues when we distrust our own ability to discern the right answer. Now, we all do this. If you're doing making a, an important decision of some kind, you may stop and consult with one of your friends whose opinion you respect. And you say, help me think this through a bit. I think I've got the right idea here, but I'd like to just talk about it and think it through. That's deliberation, when you're weighing the different possibilities. So we don't deliberate about the human end or the goal of human existence, which is happiness, but we do deliberate about what promotes or gets us to it, to that goal, which is human happiness. Because there may be many ways for us to do this. We may have different kinds of talents, we have to find our own way there, and it's up to us to decide what actions to do as we seek out what is good for us. So, in this case, then, the scope and method of deliberation is as follows. First, we consider the means to reach an end previously laid down. So the goal is to go, let's say the goal is to go to City Hall in Chicago. We consider how certain means will enable us to reach an end. Car, go by car, by train, by plane, by bus, we walk, all these are possibilities. So we consider how certain means will enable us to reach an end and how the means itself, the middle point, 
is actually received, reached as well. So, okay, I decided to go by car. Well, how do I get a car? So I have to rent a car. I have to think all this through. We keep doing this until we come right back up to the first moment, as it were, now. If we're going to Chicago, we must take that first step forward. If we're going to Chicago, we must go to the ticket office for the train ticket and buy the train ticket. So we go backwards. We go to Chicago. Chicago is our goal. What else we do here? We'll take the train. Okay, but the tr train means we have to take a taxi afterward. All right, so that we have Chicago, taxi to Chicago, train that gets us to the taxi stand area. And before that, we have to go to the ticket office to get the ticket. And so we work backwards until we come to the first thing, the first action that we take that is, that is the, on the road to attaining the final end of being in Chicago. And that's what he means when Aristotle says, the last thing found in the analysis of how to get to Chicago, the very last thing is, I've got to go to the ticket office. It's the first thing that comes to be, the first thing I must do. That's what Aristotle is talking about here as he describes the, the scope and method of deliberation. So decision, its definition will be, decision is deliberative desire. That means it's a desire that has del deliberation. So it's a deliberative desire to do an action that is up to us for when we have judged that it is right as a result of our deliberation, our desire to do it expresses our wish. So after we've done all that, now I wish to go to the train station to buy the ticket. But I've deliberated this and now my desire is focused. So my deliberative desire or decision is to go to the train station. I wish to go to the train station. Now, this is a little tricky though sometimes because the rational wish, uh, the rational wish is for an end. So we wish for the end or goal of our action. However, do we always wish for the good? Some people say this is the case, even when we choose incorrectly. And they've got something there. We always wish for the good that is apparent to us, what seems good for us. So that's how the things seem to us. So do we wish for the good or the apparent good? This is not completely in our control. We may make misjudgments of various kinds. The solution to this is, that what is really and unconditionally wished for is the good, but each person, but for each person, what's wished is wished for uh, the apparent good. So I think the best way to get to Chicago is this. This appears to me the best, and I will take that because I determine it's the best. But I could be wrong. There may be more efficient ways to go, and I may have chosen the wrong one. So I choose what appears good to me. And this, what is the standard for this then? The standard is what the intelligent or ex excellent person would do. That is, we have ideals of what's a reasonable way to give an account of this. You know, my decision to walk to Chicago turns out to be not a very intelligent one. So Aristotle writes, the ideal or standard in this case is the person of virtue or excellence, since what he or she wishes is not only the apparent good, but also the real good. So when you think about what you're going to do with your life, you're not after, you may think that certain things will give you happiness, and that appears to be the case, but it may not in fact be the case, because you're after the real good, but you have to deal with the apparent good. So for Aristotle, vice and virtue are in our control, and the relevant actions are in our power. This is up to us what we're doing. So it's up to us, not by force or coercion, with knowledge of particulars, and then we deliberate and we decide. So this is in our control. So what we do is we wish for the end or the good. We deliberate and decide on what promotes it, it or gets us to it. And these actions are an expression of decision and they are voluntary. In this sense, then, acting or not acting are up to us, says Aristotle. Being good or bad are, are up to us. The idea that no one does wrong willingly is taken from Plato. And it's partly right and partly wrong. That is, you do what seems good to you, and that may, uh, it seems willing, but it may not turn out to be the right thing to do. So this, this causes quite a problem for us. Now, uh, let me just uh, let me move on here a bit more. So according to Aristotle, we form our character by how we live, and 
our responsibility in this is quite clear. There's a parallel between health and character. So by we form our good health by how we live, we form our good character about, uh, in the way in which we live. And this character formation is mo not, not just a matter of wishing for something. We, just as recovering from an illness takes more than wish. These take hard work and thought about what is right and habituation as to what is right through exercise or practice. Recovering from knee surgery has to involve habituation as well. So it takes hard work to, to set this up. And the analogy between health, uh, the health of the self, you might say, the, and the health of the physical, physical body is rather clear for Aristotle. And they both require our thought determining what is right and then exercise or practice that is habituation but that question that I mentioned with regard to Plato pops up again for Aristotle and that's the question are is our character really up to us the reason he brings a question is that it seems that sometimes or quite often we're not responsible for our initial formation of our attitudes and habits as children they come from our social setting and from our genetic disposition so the objection is this, everyone aims at the apparent good, but none of us can control how reality appears to us. Character seems to control that. And yet we were not there in the beginning to form our own character, so how are we responsible? Is it, wouldn't we put the responsibility for our character, our wants, our needs, our desires, and what we determined is to be good, and what is a good thing and what is a bad thing? Wasn't that put in us by our parents and also our social context? perhaps we're not responsible at all for any of this. That's the platonic objection that Aristotle responds to. So the reply according to Aristotle is, each person is responsible for character and so responsible for how character affects his or her perceptions. Consequences of the objection are these. Character we see as a consequence to be a result of nature, or as I put it, genetic coding on the uh, unfolding in natural development. But this is impossible, for if it were the case, then it would under undermine the voluntary nature of virtue and vice. If we all act just in accordance with our natures and, and, and our, uh, our context. But that would under undermine all morality. So Aristotle insists that each person is responsible for his or her own character, and each person is responsible to educate him or herself sufficiently to walk around in the city, to be a moral person in many ways. So you don't go to Istanbul and, and not look at a map and not prepare for it. You have to have knowledge and, and find out where you're going and look for directions and that sort of thing. And you're responsible for that. That's knowledge. So we have to be responsible for putting ourselves in a position of knowing what is right to the extent that we can, as best we can. In sum, then, genus, and with regard to genus and uh, genus, they're the means and states. And so for Aristotle, virtue is up to us and voluntary. And he says the actions we control beginning to end, but states we control mostly at the start. That is the formation of good habits. We control them mostly at the start because they start being habitual to us after we do them again and again. So too with regard to bad things. You control your desire for smoking mostly in the beginning. Once it becomes a habit, it's harder to control. These states gradually leave out easy control because of the cumulative effect of actions and habits. So I smoked for a long time and it was easy to begin. and I could have stopped it right away, but once I became, as it were, addicted to smoking, it became extremely difficult to change my habitual use of tobacco. But I was able to do it. Still, even if I could do it, since the origin and the beginnings of cigarette smoking was with me, it was voluntary. And so too with regard to our moral actions. So I'm going to stop here with, with this video. It's a bit longer than I wanted to go, but I'm going to stop here, and the next video will be on, uh, on the McKean Ethics Book 5. So with this video, I've gone through parts of uh, two, uh, book, book 2 to Book uh, 3, and then uh, book three and a little bit of book four. And that's the story.